Calcat, and he's uh, going to be telling us about the group of vertebrates which we don't have in the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. So this is our yearly token to fish, uh, which we're looking forward to. So welcome. It's, which happens to be the most diverse group of vertebrates. <laughs> Can we get the lights just a little bit lower? Right, if not, it's fine. And I have some. One of my hobbies is photography, and I have some nice ones there. Um, I always like to show them around. <coughs> All right, so just a brief overview of the talk. I'll start talking about our fish collection, just a little bit, one slide, and then uh, we'll go to answer this question, what a species is. It's a very simple question, easy to answer. Um, I do that all the time because if I don't put one of those in my talk, if I don't say what a, I think a species is, everybody, well, eventually, somebody will ask me at the end of the talk, so to avoid the question, I'll just answer it up front. Uh, we'll talk about geographic context of speciation. I mean, I know everybody's familiar with that here, so I'm going to go very fast with that, through that. Uh, then we'll talk about reef fishes and finally speciation, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, work that I'm starting to do with deep reef fishes. So the fish collection, we don't have one here, but we have one there just across the bridge, and it happens to be one of the top five in the world, I'd say. It's a very, very large collection. We have more than 230,000 lots, uh, about 1.3 million species. It's the second most diverse collection in the country, about 13,000 different species. Uh, the second largest in the number of types. We have almost 6,000 types, 2,000 holotypes, and 4,000 paratypes. So it's a very, very important collection. Uh, the Smithsonian, by the way, is the only one that is uh, largest than that. So if you want to visit it, or if you want to take students to see a little bit of the rest of the diversity of vertebrates, <laughs> feel free to hit me up. All right, so what is a species? Uh, you can define it in 30 or 40 different ways, depending on which author you uh, follow. Uh, the most accepted or the most uh, known concept is a biological one, which involves uh, reproductive isolation. But there are a myriad of other, uh, of other uh, concepts that try to be more inclusive than the uh, biological concept. The one that I happen to like a lot is the taxonomic one. It's a completely subjective one. It says that just um, if a taxonomer that is specialist in that group says it's a species, then it's a species. <laughs> so that's my concept, I guess. But in all seriousness, I mean, uh, one of the uh, uh, solutions that was proposed by Kevin DeCaro and one that I like a lot in particular is that there's this area here. There's two areas, actually, in the process of uh, diversification where everybody agrees that it's one species when there's just one population. You can't tell anything apart, so it's one species or when there's two different things that everybody immediately recognizes as species. So those two areas, everybody agrees that they're actually species. But the area in here, which is where things start diversify or start differentiating and then eventually become species, is where all the disagreement is. And the solution that Kevin proposed was that we use qualifiers before species. So if we want to call something that has uh, that inhabits different niches as different species, we call it a, an ecological species. If we want to call something that has I mean, reproduct it's reproductively isolated from each other, we call it a biological species and so on. So I particularly like that solution a lot, and I've been using it a lot lately. But in my case, since I study <laughs> speciation, I don't really care too much about the concept. So it's a nice philosophical question, but uh, to me, at least for my speciation studies, I don't try to define it in either one way or the other. So very quickly, uh, just to put everybody on the same page, the three famous models of speciation, Arapatric, <coughs> Arapatric and Sympatric. Allopatric is the one that proceeds from complete isolation. Parapatric, you have adjacent populations. Usually, uh, one of them uh, adapts to a different habitat. So say that you have a forest uh, organism that adapts to uh, the adjacent uh, open area. Uh, and then eventually becomes a different species. I would call that parapatric speciation. And then sympatric speciation is when speciation occurs within the species range, so with no geographic uh, isolation <coughs> at, at all. All right, so why study uh, speciation in reef fishes? There's uh, several different uh, reasons for that. My main reason is because I like diving in places like this. Uh, so you're having a, a study organism that takes you to nice tropical places is not going to ever bad. But I think the main scientific reason is that uh, there's a very disproportional diversity in coral reefs. So uh, there's about 30,000 species of fish uh, worldwide, including freshwater and marine. About half of that are marine, half are freshwater, so 15,000 marine species. And about five to 6,000 are found only on reefs. So that's more than a third of all marine species that are only in reefs. But reefs are a very, very small habitat. They're only 0.1% of the surface of the oceans. 
So 0.1% of the surface of the oceans harbor more than a third of all marine species. So that begs the question, why is it so diverse? Why is the ecosystem so diverse? Now, before I go into actually showing some examples of speciation in reef fishes, I'll tell you a little bit about their biology, which is very important uh, in order to understand phylogenetics and phylogeography and population genetics in those organisms. So all of the, all, almost all reef fishes, maybe 95, 98% of reef fishes have what we call a bipartite life stage. They have a very sedentary adult life. They live very close to a reef, not bigger than this room here, so that's the entire uh, home range of most reef fish species. Uh, but when they reproduce, they produce uh, pelagic larvae. So the eggs, sometimes they're uh, pelagic or not, but the larvae are always pelagic. Uh, and that larvae, depending on how long it lasts in the plankton, the longer it stays in the plankton, the more it disperses. So when, uh, when the fish are adults, or even juveniles, but after they're settled to the reef, they're very sedentary, and then they reproduce, they produce those larvae, and the larvae can stay in the plankton for between two weeks to two or three months, four months sometimes for some species. So the longer the pelagic larval stage, the more potential for dispersal they have. They never disperse as adults, only as larvae. All right, so because of the larval stage, uh, a lot of uh, uh, faunas are very, a lot of places that you go to are very similar to each other. For example, if you go to an island in the Southern Caribbean and to Florida, all the fish in there are going to be almost the same. There's less than 1% of the fauna between Florida and the Southern Caribbean is different. Everything else is exactly the same. And the reason for that is because of that pelagic level stage and because there's no major biogeographic barrier within the Caribbean. So these are the bio major biogeographic barriers that impact uh, uh, reef, coral reefs in general, and divide uh, major biogeographic regions in the world. So we have here the East Pacific barrier is an open water uh, distance between the last islands of the South Pacific and the first ones of the tropical Eastern Pacific. So we have that pelagic level stage, but even the pelagic level stage has a limit. So when you have a barrier like this that is 4,000 kilometers wide, even fish that stay two months in the water column as a larvae, they cannot cross that, that far, uh, far of a distance, unless there's something pushing them, like El Nino. So when there's an El Nino where the, all the currents revert, there's a lot of larvae that, from the, that come from the South Pacific towards the tropical Eastern Pacific. But that's uh, rare, and a lot of the times it's only a few larvae that make a cross, and uh, the population never gets established. The Isthmus of Panama is another uh, barrier that separates uh, the Caribbean from the tropical Eastern Pacific. That's a very well studied one, very well dated from a geological perspective. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more detail about it uh, four or five slides. The Amazon barrier uh, is the fresh water that comes out from the Amazon. So just to give you perspective here, the Amazon River discharges about 50 to 60 times more fresh water and sediments than the Mississippi River Basin. So there's a lot of fresh water and sediments coming out here. And reefs, they require clear water and, and warm water to survive. So the water here is warm, but it's not clear because of the Amazon discharge. So there's no reefs in this entire area, and it forms a barrier between the Caribbean and Brazil. So the endemism of fishes in Brazil is about 14%. So even with the barrier here, 86% of the species between Brazil and the Caribbean are the same. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic barrier uh, is the one that separates the uh, uh, or the coast of Brazil and Africa, and it's, it's analog to the uh, East Pacific barriers, another open, op open ocean distance barrier. The Benguela barrier, so I just said that the reefs uh, require warm water. The Benguela barrier is a upwelling of cold water around the, uh, the South Africa that kills everything that is warm water and comes around through the uh, uh, Agulhas current there. The Old World barrier is an old barrier that formed when Africa collided with the Middle East and closed the Tati Sea. And the Sunda Shelf Barrier, which I will talk a little bit more detail, is uh, the one that forms. So all of these islands here, starting with Southeast Asia, the peninsulas in Malaysia, and Indonesia, and Borneo, all of these islands here, they're separated by very shallow seas. There's a very, sh very shallow uh, uh, continental shelf there that we call Sunda Shelf. And when the sea level drops in glacial periods, uh, all of those islands get connected, and there's a lot of land there that basically almost entirely separates the Pacific from uh, the Indian Ocean. And if, separate, if, it, if it separates the oceans, there's no water flow and there's no larval flow. So let's start with uh, some results from recent phylogeography studies. So one of the things that we do is look at species that are the same across some of those barriers, and we look at their genetics, usually, usually 
one or two loci, so um, my mitochondrial and nuclear. And uh, we sample them in a lot of locations and, and uh, we, we do the basic phylogeographic work. So I'll talk a little bit about two of those uh, uh, examples of those type of work that we did recently. A pair of surgeon fishes and a pair of rasses that prior to this study were considered just one species. So we collected them in those locations across Hawaii, Marshall Islands, Christmas Island, American Samoa, Morea. As you can see, all bad locations, very hard to work to travel to those places. Um, and I'll show you just one uh, of the networks here because this, the results from both species, both complexes of species are very, very similar. Um, do I need to explain what the haplotype network is? <laughs> All right, so uh, clearly here we can see that uh, there's two clusters in the haplotype network separated by 25 mutations. This one is the surgeon fish one. The, the one for the rasses is, is, uh, is very similar, but there's less mutations between the two. Um, we have a lot of less diversity in Hawaii. These are the, uh, the Hawaiian ones, uh, and that's expected because Hawaii is, is a much smaller archipelago than we're comparing just Hawaii to four or five locations in the South Pacific, so the geographic scale of the Pacific is much, much bigger than Hawaii, so we have more genetic diversity. But within the region, so within Hawaii and within the Pacific, there's not much uh, difference between the islands. So if you look at between the islands, the phi is negative or zero for all of the, uh, all of the locations. And that was very similar to uh, what we found for the races. So that led us to separate those. So these were considered only one species, and we led us, we led, led us to separate them in different species. And those were the speciation mechanism that, ha that probably happened for those guys was the isolation of the Hawaiian archipelago. So Hawaii, even though it's not considered a biogeographic region by itself, so that's why I didn't draw the, uh, the line in that figure there, there's still a lot of distance between Hawaii and, uh, and the South Pacific Islands and a lot of larvae they don't cross, or if they do cross that distance, it's only a few larvae, so they are not, the migration is not strong enough to counter either drift or selection in that place. So uh, we split the surgeon fish in two species, Eganturus nigraris and Eganturus nigris, and the rest, again, two species also, Laurinatissimus and Claudia. And that brings us back, takes us back to the question. So this is, as I said, a classic case of peripheral allopatric speciation, but are they really species? I mean, can we use one of those definitions to say if they're species or not? Uh, by the taxonomic definition, yes, they're species. The, uh, the uh, biological species, we don't know because we can't, I mean, they don't mate, they don't uh, do very well in tanks. So, well, they do well in tanks, but they don't breed in tanks. So we can't put them together to see if they, they would leave uh, fertile hybrids or not. But one of the reasons why I'm, even, I'm naming a lot of species lately is because I'm taking the cautionary uh, uh, approach of just, uh, naming species based on uh, conservation. So the IUCN is the, the, the uh, agency that, that runs and builds that uh, red list of endangered species and their units for evaluations, for criteria, for categories, for endangered and non-endangered and critically endangered, so on is species. So if you don't name something a species, they won't, uh, they won't uh, uh, put, them, put it in any category. So just from a conserv conservation perspective, I'm more and more, if I find the genetic difference and the morphological dis difference, which in this case is the color, so there's a little bit of color difference between the uh, surgeon fishes and a lot of color difference between the races. So if I find two uh, differences in, uh, in agreement in color, morphology, and genes, I go ahead and call it a species just based on the, uh, on the conservation uh, element. So there's a lot of those species that are collected for the aquarium trade in a lot of places. And um, if they're not split in different species, they're not managed differently. They're just managed as one entire species. So what's happening in Hawaii right now is that they're trying to close the aquarium trade there, the uh, exploration from the aquarium trade, uh, which I don't think it's a very good idea just to close the whole thing. You know, we can actually go species by species, but they're actually talking about closing the whole thing. And because we split those species, so the Hawaiian, there's now one Hawaiian endemic and one that is uh, widely distributed in the Pacific, the Hawaiian ones will be protected just because they're endemic. All right, a second case of uh, a phylogeographic study involved, this one involves uh, parapatric speciation. This is a grouper, uh, common name is Roy or Peacock bass. It's widespread throughout the Indo-Pacific, both Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. Uh, here's the haplotype network. 
the greenish shade is Indian Ocean haplotypes, and the browns and blues, or the green and brown, are West, brown, is West, brown is Western Australia, blues are uh, uh, South Pacific, and yellows are Central Pacific. So there is a difference between Pacific and Indian Ocean, but there is a lot, also a lot of mixing. So the yellow there is Central Pacific. It appears in the uh, Indian Ocean uh, clay. If we put this in a map, so we see here that there is a break between the two different clays, but they're, they're not reciprocally monophyletic. There's a lot of uh, some exchange between the clays. If we put that in a map, we can see that the uh, entire Indian Ocean is a relatively isolated unit. Then we have a few islands in the southern Indian Ocean here, close to that, those openings between the islands that have a mix of the two haplotype types, the two haplogroups, the ones from the Pacific and the ones from the Atlantic. And we have some of the Indian Ocean haplotypes showing up in Pacific locations as far as Palmyra and uh, Kiribati, Christmas Island. So there's a lot of leakage from the Indian Ocean to the uh, Pacific. And we think that's because of, again, El Nino. When El Nino happens, there's a strong current that runs from the West Pacific towards the central, towards the tropical Eastern Pacific and potentially carries a lot of larvae from the uh, uh, Indonesia area towards the central and south Pacific. We found a very similar uh, case in this grass here, uh, Helicaris hortulanus, the checkerboard grass. Uh, it's not as a clean break, as clean break as it is in the, the other species, and there's a lot more mixing in this one and not uh, not a clear break as in the other one. But the, the overall history is the same. So we have a mostly pure Indian Ocean group with a lot of leakage from the Indian Ocean towards the Pacific. So the uh, Sunda Shelf Bear is what we call a uh, permeable barrier. There's a lot of things going one side to the other. And <coughs> it varies its effectiveness a lot. So when the sea level is lower, all of these areas here, all of these islands, they get connected. Everything becomes land here. And there's a lot less, a lot less uh, water flow between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. All right, so switching gears to phylogenies now. Uh, this I'm going to talk about the phylogeny of uh, genus uh, Runtz, Himilon. Uh, so the genus has about 19 species. They're restricted to the Americas. There's about nine species in the tropical Eastern Pacific, another 10 in the um, uh, Caribbean side. They're commercially important species. They have a very large biomass. They have a relatively short biologic uh, level stage. That's why we think the whole group remained uh, uh, relatively restricted to the New World. So as I said, I was going to talk in a little bit more detail about the isthmus of Panama. Uh, this is how it looked like 15 million years ago, 7 million, 5 million, and then it finally closed at 3 million. So uh, a lot of processes, tectonic processes, both pushing South America towards Central America and the uplifting of islands in the Central America region caused the closure of the isthmus of Panama. And a lot of molecular biologists, because of these that we call uh, sister or sibling species, um, a lot of molecular biologists use that closure that is very well dated geologically at about 3 million years, uh, between 2.8 and 3.1 million years. Uh, a lot of uh, molecular biologists use that closure and the sister species to calibrate molecular clocks. But if you think, so just one exception here. Oh, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the bear at 15, or between 15 and 7 million years old, it looks exactly like the Sunda shelf looks today. And we are already seeing those 3-5% differences between fish in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean consistently. We saw that for about five or six species. So we think that uh, there's an error. Well, a lot of people think that actually, that there's an error between uh, uh, or uh, using those sibling species to calculate the molecular, calibrate molecular clock includes, includes makes you uh, makes you do erroneous uh, conclusions. All right, so because the grunts have uh, half of the species in one side of the isthmus and the other half on the other side, uh, we thought that, well, since the isthmus closed about three million years ago, half the species are going to be, well, there's going to be a lot of sister species pairs that are split by the isthmus of Panama. But when we looked at the actual tree, so this one is the mitochondrial DNA tree, and that's the nuclear DNA tree, uh, that wasn't the case at all. The sister species pair shaded in blue here 
are all St. Patrick. They have the exact same distribution. The one shaded in red is the only pair that is one species in one side of the isthmus and the other species in the other side. So, and it's the only pair where the two species were actually still named the same thing. So they had the same name, even though they were one in each side of the isthmus of Panama. All of the other species, they were named species, well-known species, but none of them was split by the isthmus of Panama. And most, of, all of them have some degree of overlap in the <coughs> geographic distribution. So they're either completely overlapping or partially overlapping distributions. And we have, I know you can't see the numbers here, but we have a lot of support for all of the, most of these nodes, all of these nodes. I think the lowest support we have here is 77, and in a nuclear tree, the lowest support is 64. But when you combine the two, we have even higher support uh, for all those nodes. So uh, it's a very consistent uh, phylogeny. We used two mitochondrial genes and two uh, nuclear, <coughs> or two nuclear inference for a total of almost, what, 3,000 base pairs. So this is one of those examples, Himalon maculicata and Himalon flavigutatum. They have the exact same distribution in the tropical eastern Pacific. Uh, you go to a reef, you find both species just swimming together. And these are them here, the both of them in the trees. So if you remember correctly, I just said this one is the mitochondrial one, and that one is the nuclear one. So what's, what's wrong with this picture here? The mitochondrial one is less divergent than the nuclear one. There's almost no difference here. At first, I thought I had some mix up with the tissue samples or something, but uh, the divergence here is about 0.1% between the two species. And in the nuclear gene, it's almost 1%. So the nuclear is supposed to be a lot slower than the mitochondrial. And we consistently find mitochondrial flavigutatum within maculicaldo. And we thought that this was caused by recent uh, introgression or hybridization between those two species. Now, morphologically, they're very different. So there's no question that they are good species and not just morphologically, but also ecologically. This one is a bottom dweller, feeds on the bottom, feeds on uh, benthic invertebrates. This one is more of a pelagic species. It's up in the water column on plankton mostly. So there's uh, morphological differences, there's ecological differences, yet they're closely related sister species in the mitochondrial DNA is almost identical. And that's from different locations also. It's not just one location. So because I found the mitochondrial DNA was so close, I thought, no, oh, maybe there's something going on here. So I sampled these for all of the other species. I have maybe five or 10 total for each species. For these guys, I have 30 or 40 of each from five or six different locations because I wanted to make sure that um, you know, that was actually going on. That was not just some sort of error. And I've run the, all of the analysis and I've sequenced their, both of all of the genes in the data set. I've sequenced for those species in two different labs just to make sure there was no contamination going on. So it's real. And that made me think that there's a possibility of other cases of hybridization going on in this, in this particular genus, this particular group of fish. So I started looking at these three guys here, Himilum flavulumiaritum, Himilum carbonari, and Himilum acarsum. They are three of the most abundant reef fish species in the Caribbean. You find thousands of them uh, in any shallow reef across the Caribbean. They have the exact same distribution from Trinidad and Tobago to North Florida. And chances are, if you go snorkeling in the Caribbean, you'll find the three species in the same reef. <coughs> now, the mitochondrial DNA put macrosomum and carbonarium together and flavolineatum as a, uh, an outgroup. The, one of the nuclear genes put the two, uh, uh, the same group, they had the same topology as the mitochondrial one, and the other nuclear gene had different topology. Carbonarium and flavolineatum were together, and macrosomum was the outside one. So I started looking at other characters. Uh, when I looked at morphology, so the black lines here represent the measurements of Himalon uh, flavulineatum, the one in the top. The blue lines, Himalon carbonarium, the one in the center. And the bottom line here, it's Himalon macrosum, the one in the bottom. Every character that I could measure in the center species there, Himalon carbonarium, is intermediate between the two other species. So every species in the genus, and I did a morphological analysis for the entire genus, so every species in the genus has at least three or four unique characters. This one, if we treat these two as a single species, that one has not. So it's either overlapping with one species or with the other completely. So there's no unique character for that species. Now that made me start thinking that 
this is a possible hybrid between the other two are a possible case of hybrid speciation. We know it's not a hybrid, an F1 hybrid, because uh, there are genetic differences that we can actually put them different in different parts of the tree. So I looked at their development. About half of the species of the genus, so all of these guys, when they're juveniles, they have a very different color pattern than when they are adults. So when they're adults, they're colorful like this. Usually, they always have orange or yellow in the body. When they're juveniles, they're silvery with black stripes. About half the species they group, they have a black stripe that goes from the top of the eye and stops in the top of the gill uh, opening. The other half, that stripe goes all the way to, the, to meet the, uh, the center line of the body under the soft dorsal fin. Flavo, uh, Carbonari on the potential hybrid species is the only one that on the entire mm -hmm. genus of the 19 species that has an intermediate condition between the two with the mm -hmm. line stopping in the middle of the body, not, not neither on the top of the rater nor closing the gap with the other species. Something very interesting about these three guys also is that they have a pheromone producing urinary gland in adult males. So all of the other species of the genus they have this fat body in the same place as the other species. There was a, luckily enough for me, there was some histological work that was done back in the 90s, and they looked at this gland, they tried to find it in all of the species of the genus, and these, only these three guys have this, this particular gland here. So that would be a mechanism that would actually allow uh, back when, whenever the two parent species crossed a, uh, 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 a chemically uh, incompatible hybrid that couldn't cross back to the other parents. But that's all speculation at this point. So that's why I haven't published yet. I'm still working on it. Um, so one other thing very interesting about this genus that may allow for both the hybrid speciation scenario and the, the, the sympatric speciation scenario, which are the species pairs uh, shaded in blue here, is that they produce sound. That's why they're called grunts. So let's take a look at the detail at these two guys here, which is Plumiera and Cirrus. They're both very well supported in the nuclear and the mitochondrial tree. And here they are here. This one is Plumiera, uh, this one is Cirrus, this one is Plumiera. So they swim together in the same schools wherever they, they co-occur. And let me see if this is going to work. This is the sound that Plumiera produces. Here in the back? All right. So that's why they're called grunts. And that's the sound that the other species produce. So there's all sorts of potential mechanisms that may allow this group to undergo sympatric speciation or, or speciation by hybridization or a few other things like that. <coughs> Um, we're still working on it, including using next-gen techniques for the, the group of the three species that we think one of them is a hybrid. We're doing transcriptomes for all three and trying to develop red tags. Um, so we'll see how it can get. All right, so changing oceans now to the Pacific Ocean. Let's talk a little bit about pygmy angelfishes. Uh, this is a paper <coughs> that just accepted, so it should be coming out in the next six months or so. Uh, pygmy angelfishes are very colorful fish. They're very common in the aquarium trade. There's about uh, 25 species in the genus. Uh, they have, in their, one very interesting thing about the whole genus is that uh, there's quite a few species that have overlapping ranges and they produce hybrids. So there's a lot of hybrids described for those guys. Now the group that we're going to be focusing on is this group with three species, and I have this one as the same as the other one for a reason here. Uh, this one is Central Pigi Abli, is the purple range here. That one is Central Pigi Vrolica, is the Central Pacific range. And that one is Central Pigi Flavissimus, is the green range in the South Pacific, Southwestern Pacific. So as you can see, they overlap here in the Indonesia area and the Central Pacific. And oddly enough, the, uh, uh, the one in the corner there, Central Pigi Flavissimus, the yellow one, so it's absent from the entire area here in the central uh, western Pacific, from Australia, Indonesia, the Coral Triangle, but it shows up again in the Cocos Killing and Christmas Island. So this is actually what uh, first uh, led us to start this study. We wanted to do a phylogeography of Central Pigi flavicinus because 
of this population here, we thought it was something different. So, but because those two species are so close to it, morphologically, uh, we decided to use them as relatively um, uh, odd groups for the phylogeny. Now, interestingly enough, there's hybrids all over the place. So in this area here, we find this, that is a hybrid between this and that. It's the yellow one with the black tail. In this area here, in those islands, where these two overlap, we find this, that is a hybrid between those two with the yellow and the stripes and the black tail. So, that's the tree that we got. Uh, this one is based on mitochondrial DNA, and this one is the nuclear tree. So let me go through the mitochondrial one first. Um, so, as we expected, we found three lineages, which we thought were corresponding to the three species, but they are not. This first lineage here is the Pacific Ocean Flavissimus, so it's the yellow one, plus all the Vrolicae, plus all the gray and black one. This lineage here is only the yellow one from the very south Pacific, very southeastern Pacific, Maria and French Polynesia, and this one is the Indian Ocean guy, Centropeach Abli, and all of the yellow guys from the Indo-Pacific, from the Indian Ocean. I have a map here that's going to make it more, a little bit more clear. And for the uh, uh, nuclear genes, those are the, the haplotype networks for all of the species. So there's a big mix between all of the species in the nuclear gene. There's almost no difference. We can tell there's a FST of 0 0.10, 0 0.15 between species, but uh, it's not very, between uh, clades actually, not between species, but it's not very well defined. So the map is going to show you here a little bit more. So this is the distribution of this is the distribution of the species as we know as we call them today. The green green range is the yellow one, plus this one here. The purple range is the striped one, center PGA bly, and the brown one is the gray and black one. And this is the distribution of the genetic clades. So we find one clade here with only this guy. That central clade here, the biggest one, with these two guys in the Indian Ocean clade with these three guys here. And these, the, there's a lot of pure uh, flavissimus in this clade too. So this area here encompasses almost all of these guys except the ones from French Polynesia. This, uh, these guys and this area here encompasses both of these guys and the hybrids. So it's a complete mess. So what we think there's, we're working actually in two hypotheses. One of them is that uh, at some point in time, those three species, they started diverging in allopatry. So one in the far southern Pacific, one in the central Pacific, and one in the Indian Ocean. And with the raise of the sea level, their populations grew a lot, and they started mixing again. And uh, the mitochondrial DNA got all jumbled up. The other hypothesis is that this yellow guy here originated uh, uh, separately from that yellow guy. So two, ex two uh, possible uh, xanthic, xanthic coloration origination there in that particular area. But again, I mean, we know very little about the genetic basis of color in those guys, so it's all speculation at this, at this point. Now, what makes this story even more interesting is that this group served the angelfish serve as a model. It was a very, very peculiar uh, uh, mimicry relationship in the Pacific. So this guy is not the same as this guy. This is a mimic surgeon fish. It's a different family altogether. It's not even the same order of fish. That one is another mimic surgeon fish. It's not the same as this guy. But they are the same species. The surgeon fish are the same species. So the surgeon fish, the mimic, or the, the model, the angelfish, they're called, their common name is pygmy angelfish. Most angelfish, they got really big, but the pygmy angelfish, the entire gene is central PG. They don't grow more than two inches or so, two, two and a half inches. But the surgeon fish, it grows a lot. It grows to five, ten inches sometimes. So the surgeon fish mimics the angelfish until it gets to the size of the angelfish. After it outgrows the angelfish, it then turns into adult colors, and the adult color is the same for both guys, for the yellow one and the black and gray one. So we call them as a, the same species. But depending on where it is in the range, it mimics either that or that. Now what makes it really interesting is that when it overlaps 
with the hybrid, it mimics the hybrid. <laughs> so it's a crazy, crazy system that we're just starting to study now. I have a lot of samples that we collected five, six years ago for mitochondrial DNA analysis, and a mitochondrial DNA didn't give us anything. So because the samples are preserved in alcohol and DMSO, they're no good for next-gen sequencing. So we're going to have to go back and, yeah. So why is there mimicry again? I mean, is this so why is the mimicry? system or? There's a, there's a lot of discussion about that, actually. Um, the first proposed idea was by Jack Randall, which was one of the greatest etiologists ever that ever lived. He's described more than 600 species, I think, so he knows this fish. Uh, but he proposed that, so these angelfish, they're very wary. They hide, they're very hard to photograph, they're a very cryptic species. So he proposed that by looking like the angelfish, the surgeon fish, could uh, maybe avoid predation because the predators wouldn't go after them because they know they were hard fish. But I mean, I didn't buy that, so and neither did a lot of other people. So a group in, uh, from Australia working in um, Papua New Guinea, they found out, well, they did a diet study of these guys and compared the diet of these guys, the mimic surgeon fish, to the diet of other surgeon fish in the area. And they realized that the, the, the algae in the surgeon fish was about 30 to 40 percent better nutritionally than the other the, the algae of the other the other surgeon fish and the reason for that was because the surgeon fish they get because they look like the angel fish they get access to the very aggressive the, the territorial uh, denso fish territories mm -hmm. so every reef they have a lot of denso fish that are very aggressive they're called farmers of the reef they keep a little territory I mean maybe it's maybe smaller than this table but inside their territories, they, they defend that so aggressively that inside the territories is where you find the most diverse algae in the entire reef because they farm it, they don't completely wipe it out, and they keep all the other herbivore fish out. But they're not so aggressive against fish that are not herbivores, and the angelfish is not a herbivore. So the surgeon fish looks like a spongivore, the angelfish is a spongivore, gets access to the, the territory of the denso fish and it gets a 30-40% feeding advantage over all of the other herbivores in the area. So it's a, it's a crazy mimicry. And I'm really bummed about that because I figured that out and when I came back, I figured it out at the Marquesas, when I came back and I started even writing a manuscript, I found that the guys from Australia did the same thing. So. Uh, all right, so a second a very interesting case in this particular genus. Um, these uh, two guys here, Central PG Freogata, is one that occurs mostly in Japan. I didn't go up here, but it goes all the way up from Japan to uh, northern Philippines. Central PG Lauriculus is a very widely distributed species across the entire Pacific, goes all the way out to Indonesia, and also uh, the northern Philippines. And there's a region here in the northern Philippines where both of these two species overlap, and they hybridize. So uh, this hybrid showed up in the uh, aquarium trade about six months ago or so, and a, a friend of mine that likes angelfish a lot, he wasn't sure if it was in a hybrid or not, so he sent me the tissues, and I, I sequenced nuclear and mitochondria from both of these species and this guy, and I, I figured that this was uh, actually an F1 hybrid between those. Uh, the, this is the, the father species, that's the mother species there. Um, and uh, what's really interesting about this case is not that, it's this. So there's a third species described from the Mariana Islands that looks exactly like the hybrid. So if you put this hybrid and this guy in a tank together, you cannot tell them apart. Um, and this one is a good species. We run the phylogeography, we combine the, all, all the genes that we had for these two guys, we run for <coughs> this guy too, except that the same thing so that splitting, the, the changing branches, well, sometimes it clusters with this, sometimes it clusters with that. Same thing that happened with the grunts happens with this guy <coughs> also. So some genes, some nuclear genes, put these two together. Some others put these two together. And the mitochondrial gene, the mitochondrial of these three species is actually relatively different. It's about 3 or 4% difference between them. So we know this is not an F1 hybrid, but it looks exactly like the F1 hybrid between the two species. So that's another possible case of uh, speciation by hybridization. In this case here, uh, it's a little bit different than the case of the grunts. So the grunts are all bunched, bunched up together in the same geographic area. In this case, Centropedia shepardi, the third species, <laughs> is in an area where neither, the two, <laughs> neither of the two parent species are. So what we think that happened is that at some point in the past, both of them, a few migrants of both of them made it to the Mariana Islands 
and then because there was many of them, they crossed, they formed the hybrid, and then the hybrid, because there was not a lot of influx of either, either of the parent species, the hybrids took off and then became their own, their own thing. So just to summarize here, uh, many uh, reef fish species pairs, they have overlapping distributions, uh, which suggests that mechanisms other than the classical allopathic <coughs> speciation may be operating. So now, even though I showed a lot of circumstantial evidence, it's very hard to prove those cases, um, and uh, the solution is comparative genomics. I think we'll see. Uh, so, as everybody knows, uh, the human genome was sequenced ten years ago. It costed two billion dollars. Today, to sequence a human genome is fifty thousand. And there's people announcing some companies that are there announcing that it's going to be a thousand dollars to sequence a human genome so really soon. So, that technology trickles down to us, and we can use it. Uh, uh, to play with our little fish. Um, we did a 454 run. I'm sure everybody here is very familiar with that. Uh, but we got hundreds of thousands of base pairs uh, for all of these guys that we did. Um, interestingly enough, for one of the species, you know, Maculicado, one of the contexts that we took, we got back was 16,350 base pairs long. It turned out it was the whole mitochondria. Mm -hmm. So we didn't even try to do that. We didn't purify for that. It just happened that there was a lot of mitochondria being in there. And uh, one of the contexts that we get was the whole mitochondria. So <laughs> it was uh, very interesting. And we're working now with, uh, with this data. And we're trying to produce uh, red tags. And we're trying to do transcriptome of these three guys. And we eventually, hopefully, when, when the genomes prices to do genomes get a little bit lower. We plan on doing something like this, which is a study that was done with uh, uh, red tags in uh, sticklebacks, where they compared uh, several populations of sticklebacks using red tags, about 20 individuals per population. So it's a total sample size of 100 species. They had five populations. And when they compared two populations that were sympatric and potentially, or at least parapatric adjacent, and potentially exchanged genes, so this scale on the left here is FST. So the higher the peak, the higher the uh, FST. So they found very little difference between for two populations that are adjacent to each other. They found a lot of difference everywhere. And this is the position, the horizontal axis is the position in the genome. So they found a lot of difference everywhere in two populations that were geographically separated, as you would expect from a, a allopatric uh, type scenario. And they found small but significant difference when we look at an oceanic versus a river population. But very interestingly, the biggest differences were in known in areas of the genome that are known to code for uh, uh, genes that uh, give the ability of those fish to invade fresh waters. So that's the kind of thing you, have to, you can do with when you have whole genomes and when you know a little bit more about your fish. All right, so to summarize this portion, Evidence from reef fish suggests that speciation of gene flow may be common in the sea, uh, and the next generation sequencing is, is finally accessible and able to produce data that we can actually address those questions in a meaningful way, not just speculating stuff. So changing gears completely. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the deep the study on deep reefs that I'm starting to do. Uh, before we go into it, let's just talk a little bit about what we know about reef fishes. So there's approximately 5,000 uh, reef fish species that we know of that are named. We estimate there's another 500 up there to be described. For deep reefs, the situation is the opposite. There's a lot less species because it's not as diverse, but we know only about 10% of them. We estimate that 90% of the species are deeper than 250 feet or so. We don't know what they are. We don't know what they look like. And it's not just taxonomy. Uh, the colors, the morphology, the taxonomic relationships, the uh, phylogenetic relationships of those species that we're finding in deeper reefs, they're very, very different from the shallow ones. So the shallow ones, every time we find a new species now, it's like this, those two surgeon fish or those two wrasses that we found before. It's usually a very, something that is very similar to one another that requires genetics to, to tell apart. The, uh, the deep reef species, they're very distinctive. They're immediately recognized as, as uh, different. And here's the reason why we know so little about uh, those deep reefs. So with the normal scuba gear that everybody's familiar with, we can go down to about 200 feet or so. Uh, and with submarines, we only use it under 500 feet or so because it's very expensive. So if you want to use it as a submarine, why do like 300 feet? Just go really deep. And because there's a lot of structure here. So when the sea level is lower, 
reef grows in much deeper areas. So there's a lot of dead corals in this whole area between 200 and 500 feet. There's a lot of dead corals at that uh, uh, structure that provides hiding places for fish. So sampling an area like this with a submarine would be equivalent to sampling a rainforest with a, a helicopter. Um, you just you can't get to the small fish. You can't see much. Um, so it's very, very limited. And the normal scuba gear doesn't give us access to that. So that whole area remained, it's to this day, very, very unexplored. Now, the reason why we can't go with the normal scuba gear for those depths is because we would need to carry this much gear. And when you do carry that much gear, you can't think about collecting fish. <laughs> this guy has, I don't know, eight tanks that are strapped in his body and has more than 300 pounds of gear. Um, and the reason for that is because as you go deeper, the air gets compressed and you, you actually breathe a lot more per volume air in your lungs than you breathe in the surface. It's about, it's, uh, so 300 feet is 30 atmospheres, so it's 30 more, 30 times more air required to fuel your lungs than it does here in the surface. So we need to carry that much gas to do a deep dive with open circuit traditional uh, scuba gear. So nobody does that for science, just because it's too expensive and, and uh, too bulky and you can't do much with that much stuff. But in the next last 10 years or so, the well, what we call a rebreather technology has been uh, uh, really becoming popular. Uh, there's a lot of different manufacturers that are making rebreathers. And the biggest advantage of this rebreather apparatus is that when you breathe, so when you breathe air, when you breathe all that compressed air, uh, with an open circuit system, you, when you exhale, all of those bubbles come out and um, you just lose that, so you empty your tanks very fast. With the rebreather, when you exhale, your exhale come back to the system. There's a canister in the back with a filter, an absorbent, that removes the CO2 from the mixture and then it gets back to you. So when we breathe here, we don't use up all the oxygen in the atmosphere. We could close this room here and stay here for a few hours, nobody would die. Um, <laughs> Uh, we breathe, we burn only 5-10% of the oxygen that we actually inhale because uh, depending on how much exercise you're doing. So, uh, it, because it gives you all the oxygen back and puts a little bit more in it to keep the partial pressure of oxygen, it's a lot less bulky, you don't need to carry this much gas. So with that uh, equipment there, I can stay as long underwater as this guy here with this much tanks. So with that, we can start thinking about exploring deep reefs and, uh, and collecting fish and doing something other than just looking around. So just to give you a summary of how little we know about those deep reefs, these uh, uh, seven expeditions done in the last 20 years or so. Uh, Rich Pyle is the pioneer in Hawaii that did most of them. He's the one that started actually developing those rebitters and, uh, and he has one in his garage that he's fiddled with more than anything else. Uh, so this is the number of new species of fish, that's only fish, not counting the invertebrates, that's, uh, I don't even want to go there. Um, but uh, between 12 and 46 new species of fish in those expeditions. Exploration time, so 2.8 hours we collected 12 wow. new species, and the Fiji here is 4 hours, 46 new species. So with those two numbers at hand, we created this unit here that we call the new species per hour. <laughs> That's how many new species per hour we collected. And Fiji is so much more than all of the other locations because Fiji was the only one that all we did was collect fish. Every other expedition, there was somebody collecting uh, starfish for somebody or collecting shrimp or taking photos. In Fiji, everybody only collected fish. So there's so many new species down there that it's not even funny. All right, and that brings me to the end. Uh, I have to acknowledge my funding sources, of course. Uh, my students, my slaves, the ones that are figuring out the bioinformatics and the actual sequencing. And I'll be glad to take any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Been substantially increased from 92 to 204, and now the IUCN is in the 
quickly up with, with zoos and captive populations about what now, what is the species, what about all these conservation measures that have already been done for certain species. I was just wondering how you approach them, whether they listen to you and whether they actually change their species, yeah. number of species. So for us, the situation is not as delicate because we don't have that much critically endangered species as, as antelopes, but there are quite a few critically endangered species. But I've been to, so there's a uh, push by a group called the Global Marine Assessment, uh, Global Marine Species Assessment Network, GMSA, and they, uh, they're running workshops almost nonstop to uh, uh, evaluate all of the reef fish species. And of all of the reef fish, the only group that actually has a good proportion of species that are in some sort of threat are the groupers because of overfishing. So everything else, uh, it's either near threatened or endangered at the most, it has a very small range. So because uh, I've been involved with this group for three or four years now, I've been to five or six of their workshops, every time somebody describes a species, or I describe one, they, they write me and they say, oh, just can you do an evaluation of this species? And a lot of the time, um, it's not very, you know, it's not a lot of trouble, you just pull that one portion out and you do the reevaluation. But for, for antelopes, I can imagine how, how difficult that would be. So they, for fish, they don't mind. They, uh, they, actually, they The only thing they do is that immediately when they see something coming out, they write either the authors or somebody that they know knows the group and try to, and ask them to evaluate the, that one species and then and reevaluate the uh, the other one that included the one that is being pulled apart. But, but you, I don't know how fish work at all. Is it like with birders, where you where the more fish you see, the better? And so if you if you have more species, then that will change the aquarium system of how they sell their species and whether they're expensive or not. Not necessarily, or... no. Um, especially not in this case of cryptic species. If it's something that looks like something else, it doesn't make a lot of difference. But if it's something that we find in the deep reefs at 350 feet and nobody saw before, that goes for $30,000 in a credit trade easily. But, uh, but uh, yeah, when we split something that uh, goes through grasses, for example, they're very common in the aquarium trade. And there's no price difference between them, even if they split, because uh, they look very similar. So if you don't find one, you find the other, and, and they're common. So that what drives prices in, uh, in the aquarium trade is rarity, but the rarity is more uh, related to where they are and how deep they are. You, um, in the very beginning, you're t I think you're showing a phylogeographic network of those groupers. Uh -huh. and you're, on the slide, it said something about parapatric speciation, but you didn't... Did, I think you didn't tell us, but were there any habitat differences in the groupers, or what? No habitat difference. So we just think it's parapatric because there's gene flow going on. There's gene flow, and, uh, but they're all. Don't, do they have parapatric ranges? They do have parapatic ranges. Okay. Yeah, yeah, one adjacent to the other. Yeah. Okay. So is there just a, some maybe in the past there was a uh, geographical break, or yeah. that is no longer present yeah. today? Yeah. Okay. I think it, which is probably this on the shelf. Uh, but it's it's very in, it's it fluctuates a lot, and the periods of low sea level are usually shorter than the ones of high sea level. So okay. it's it's usually maybe ten thousand years of low sea level and thirty thousand of high. So something going on there. Yeah. I'm interested in the logistics of your field work. Do you, do you have a is there a large group of people that are all cooperating with each other, or do you actually have to go to all of these places? It seems like a, a tremendous number of places. Yes, yeah, yeah. I like, I like going to the places. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, there's always people that are happy to send to those places too, so we don't, we usually don't have a problem with that. So, but how about financing that amount of field work? Field work is expensive. Uh, it is a problem, it is expensive, uh -huh. and uh, the latest big grant that we had was an NSF grant, and we spent almost all of it with, with field. Uh -huh. uh, even though our budget was split between field and genetics. We you know, spent most of it with field, and because in the original list for the NSF was, uh, I think it was five or six species that we wanted to do phylogeography across the Indo-Pacific. And when you go to a place, you spend twenty thousand dollars in a field trip. I'm not going to collect those five mm -hmm. or six species. Right. I, I right. collect right. thirty or forty. Yeah. So now we have tissues of I don't know how many species, and mm -hmm. we just bring the NSF and say, oh, they give us an extension and gives the 50,000 to make the sequencing, and they usually do it, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, tell me something about the coloration in these fishes, because it seems like you're, a lot of the, I mean, obviously you're using these genetic characters, but then a lot of the characters that people are using are color and 
things like that, at least superficially. But it seems like a lot of these fish have the same color patterns across really wide taxonomic ranges. Right. So are, th are these all mimicry systems, or is there some convergence of color? And when you're talking about like that, the yellow fish and the, and the blue and black fish, blue-black kind of colors, I mean, are those really easy um, biochemical shifts and genetic shifts, or is we that? Don't know. So nothing's known. I mean, because no. it's really striking how similar all these fish look. Yeah. Like when you look at a fish taxon, you know, fish yeah. field guide. Right, right. They all look the same, even though you know the next page is like a whole unrelated group of fish. Just like birds, they all look the same. No, <laughs> no, it's, no it's very That's different. That's exactly birds. what I was going to say. Birds only look the same. Really time, so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, <laughs> there is some, some convergence in like things like false eyes, the spots that they have mm -hmm. in the dorsal fin. There's a lot of groups, unrelated groups that have that. But mimicry like that, where you almost can't tell apart one from the other, is very rare. It's not very common. But things like false eyes or stripes or lines, um, there's a lot of it in a lot of different groups. And there's absolutely almost nothing known about the genetic basis or the biochem biochemical basis of, of the color. Except Even the related fish. question might be like whether I mean how many species of beef fishes are known to essentially be harbor poisons in their skin, for example. Right. I'm mm -hmm. always finding these weird examples of things like pitahuis in uh, New yeah. Guinea, or mm -hmm. like yeah. I just read a paper in Proceedings B on the crested rats that are sequestering toxins, and mm -hmm. you know even weird things pop right. up with like you know sequestering toxins and. Right. We're so pretty, pretty when, 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 when uh, Jack Randall was trying to find out why the surgeon fish were mimicking the. Uh, Angelfish. That's the first thing he saw. He thought, and uh, well, the first thing he did was kill some angelfish and give it to groupers to see if they would eat it. And all of the groupers eat it invariably. So um, there's not a problem there. I mean, if they would avoid it, they would avoid it in either species. So they don't avoid it. They just. That's why I, I thought in his original supposition for having a, a cryptic species just being less hunted than the other doesn't make any sense to me because it's like a lion. A lion in the savanna, it, it never goes for a gazelle, but if she sees a sick, slow one, it will go for it. So it's the same thing, you know, a grouper might not or normally go to an angelfish, but if it sees a slow one, it will just definitely go for it. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting system. Yeah. Are there any, I guess, biochemical calculus, what about for they called cichlids. cichlids, not yet. No work. There's no. a group in Germany sequencing uh, uh, the genome of a couple of uh, okay. cichlids. And um, uh, the genome, the cichlid genome is going to be a lot better for me than the zebrafish genome. So we mentioned the zebrafish <laughs> genome. Zebrafish are cyprinids. They're freshwater fish, very, very far from, uh, from any reef fish. So mm. the uh, zebrafish genome, those 454 sequences that I did, I think only 30% of my contacts align to zebrafish genome. So it's not very good, but the cichlid, cichlids are sisters to actually to damselfishes in reefs. Mm -hmm. So they're very close, related, very close related, they're persiforms, they're very close related to a lot of marine fish. So if they find anything about genetic basis of color in cichlids, yeah. it's going to be very good for me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everyone, I think that stopped there. Thank you very much. That's <laughs> That's for sure. Probably fighting for a third.